Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker has also flown in specially to tell us the five secrets to growing influence in marketing. He's a marketing strategist, author, and CEO of Top Rank Marketing, which is a digital marketing agency that provides strategic consulting and program implementation service for top B2B and B2C brands. He's also on the Forbes Top 20 CMO Influencers of 2017. Please welcome on stage Mr. Lee Auden, please. Come on, Dalia Bajabai. He's our guest. Come on. Hello. Good Hello. afternoon, sir. So excited to be here. I love you, sir. <laughs> you know, if I don't do that, you know, they'd probably be no, sleeping. It's awesome. it's I awesome. love you. It's fantastic. And I do things my way, so. It's Thanks. a great way. It keeps us all on our toes. I am, I am really, really excited to be here. This is my very first time uh, visiting the amazing country of India. And uh, I'm, I'm really, really excited not only to be here, but uh, to, to spend a couple of days off exploring a little bit. So first, let me start off by asking you a question. How many people here can keep a secret? Nobody's raising their hand. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and this is not the deck that I gave you guys. Okay, great, no problem. Um, there we go. What am I going to talk about? Who is this guy? What is he going to say that's actually going to help us? Well, maybe I'll convince you that I'm not so bad. I'm actually going to talk about the crisis in confidence when it comes to marketing. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a journey that I've taken over the last couple of years that have really enabled me to use influence uh, to achieve some things that there's no reason we should have been able to achieve as an agency. And also, of course, the secrets. So let's get to it. Trust in business has eroded. 81% of consumers trust friends and family more than uh, advice that they get from businesses. 55% of company, or consumers don't trust uh, the companies that they do business with as much as they used to. And 65% of companies or individuals just don't trust advertising. And this is a problem. Um, so you got to wonder, well, who do consumers trust? Not marketing. <laughs> In fact, they trust your barista, the person who makes your coffee more than they trust marketing. And it's interesting to see there's just a couple of spots above car salesman and politician, which I don't know about here, but I know in the U.S. these are the most least trusted individuals on, in, the, in, the, in the business world. So it's kind of crazy. This manifests in a couple of different ways. One of the ways in which this distrust in marketing shows up is in the, the, the lifespan of a CMO. You know, CMOs have half the tenure of, of CEOs, which is crazy uh, considering the job they have to do. And this creates a bit of a volatile environment for marketers. And there's research that shows why. 73% 70, of CEOs say that marketers lack business credibility and the ability to generate sufficient growth. <laughs> That's harsh. 80% of CEOs don't trust marketers at all, but 91% of them do trust CIOs and CFOs. This is a bit of a volatile environment in which we've got to succeed at growing revenue for business. Now, on top of that, media platforms have some credibility issues. You've got fake news, inappropriate content, um, and all kinds of situations where contextual advertising is showing up against information that you really don't want to be associated with. And it's hard to say whether adding humans back to the algorithm or adding humans to the algorithm uh, will actually work. I mean, that's what Facebook is doing. Google's been doing this for a long time, but it's very tough to scale. Can you imagine every ad has to be reviewed by a human being? And then there's this whole fake news. Um, shut the fake up. <laughs> I love that. I think we need to say that to someone in, in the United States. Yes. Yes. But that's a problem. And then there's data, right? And, and how data is being used. Uh, look at the Cambridge Analytica situation and, and what Facebook has been doing. And they've been making roads to create more trust. But the fact that we don't always know how much data is being collected and what's being used for is a cause for concern for many consumers. Now, it's not like marketers have been, you know, I don't know, immune to bad behavior. 
Uh, marketers have been putting out information that is misleading or a little bit edgy or, or whatever, uh, causing distrust. The channels have been victimized by opportunists. And I don't know if you've gotten the Nigerian Prince emails, but there's a new one coming out from Warren Buffett who needs to get a million and a half out of a bank if you would just send him 500000 or $5,000. $5, uh, makes people, that kind of spam makes people not trust the channel or medium of, of, of email. And then there's companies trying to get edgy. Kendall Jenner and Pepsi can solve the racial divide in the United States all in one commercial. Maybe not. Maybe not. And then this, I, I thought this is hilarious, uh, but not really hilarious. Burger King ran an ad encouraging women to get pregnant by World Cup soccer players, giving them burgers as an incentive. What? <laughs> Somebody approved this ad and probably create some distrust of, of the brand a little bit. And then we have things like GDPR in the EU, right, where there are both some challenges. I mean, complying with GDPR, especially for some organizations, is a, that's a big digital transformation project. But it also creates some opportunities for transparency and disclosure around what's actually being done with the data and giving people control. Now, what should customers do? What customers are asking brands and social media platforms to do? 71% want us as brands, if you work for a brand, to safeguard their personal data. 70% want us to help curb the spread of fake news. 68% want us to shield them from offensive content. These are the things people want. And, and, the, and, and part of the, one of the things that consumers are doing to shield themselves from these things is to start to opt out, right? They're disengaging. And they're becoming or trying to become more anonymous. But obviously there's a cost to that right? And lack of personalization. They want their cake and they want to eat it. They want to have their cake and eat it too, as the expression goes. So what can marketers do to regain trust and credibility and influence and authority in this sort of volatile environment that we all operate under? Uh, I decided to reach out to some friends and, and, and influencers. Most of them are CMOs at different companies. Um, and ask them, because they are on the front line of solving these problems every day. And the first person I talked to was Rishi Davi, the CMO of Dun & Bradstreet. And he's like, look, folks, you know, so many people approach marketing tactically as a thing that just gets executed, when in reality, marketing's view of the world is probably one of the most powerful to inform the kinds of decisions that will ultimately grow a business and have an impact on strategy and the bottom line. And, and I happen to agree with him. I also talked to uh, Avanish Kaushik from Google, who's uh, a super enthusiastic individual, if you've ever had a chance to see him speak. Very, very smart guy. And, you know, he took a very similar, a similar view in that we've got to take a step back and look at the big picture. You know, stop, you know, solving for what he calls local maxima, like the KPIs that everyone gets all amped up about, uh, of fans, friends, followers, views, impressions, likes, clicks, and that sort of thing. Rather, focus on what he calls the global maxima, like customer happiness and impact to the business. I mean, literally everything you do should line up with those sorts of metrics. And in that way, we can increase our credibility uh, upward and to the right. I also talked to Margaret Magnarelli from uh, Monster.com. And she talked about it, uh, she answered the question a little more from an internal perspective, meaning that there's obviously a lot of credibility issues inside companies, as I was just showing examples of. And she's talking about it's important to have alignment, because obviously if you have alignment inside your company, you're going to get better results, because people contribute more effectively, but you also get more budget. On top of that, though, you've got to celebrate the wins. You've got to market your marketing, or as I like to say, publicize your publicity. Share the good news. Connect the stakeholders, involve them. And if you can provide, ultimately, value for people, they're going to trust you. So we've got to do that inside companies. Um, I also talked to Chandar from uh, Group of Software, who's the past CMO of Marketo, which is where, where I met him. And, and I, he brings data to the table. There is no better time than now, and there's no better resource than now, uh, than cold, hardline data. So, you know, whether you're qualifying success with uh, hard data by showcasing sourced and influenced revenue, 
or you're creating incentive programs that actually reward contribution to revenue versus just the marketing KPIs that are internal, and we're going to see a much more credible relationship with the C-suite in our organization. Whoop. Yeah, now you know what's coming. My embarrassing photo. Uh, and I also talked to Jeannie Mullen, who is the global CMO of Mercer. And she has her own acronym, AIR. Um, Authentic, inspirational, realistic marketing. And she takes this global, as I suppose she should, view of things. And she's saying, you know, look, if you have this authenticity, this inspirational, realistic approach to marketing, it's, it's relevant for how you communicate with people externally and do your marketing. It's relevant how you communicate internally with your stakeholders. And it's applicable both to B2B and B2C. And, and I think that has a lot of merit. I think she, it's very meaningful what she has to say. So now, I want to share a little bit about my story. Uh, I had, um, obviously, I, in 2001, I had a marketing credibility problem because no one knew who we were. We just started a brand new business. And I don't know how many people here own your own business, how many people work for a, a small, medium, or large enterprise organization, but the things I'm going to share with you here are equally relevant. Um, not only did I have a marketing credibility problem, but I had a weight problem, and I had a beard problem. I did not have a beard, which is problem, a, a big, big issue. Um, <laughs> so quickly I grew a beard, and it took me a while to lose the weight. Um, I decided to fix this problem of credibility and anonymity by building authority, credibility, and influence using content. And that really is the takeaway here. Content is uh, king and kingdom when it comes to building the, the, the authority that you need to stand out amongst the competition, but also to create meaningful experiences, the wonderful storytelling experiences like Deidre was sharing. So my journey as an individual, now, um, I, uh, you know, I own an agency, and so you know, when I speak, I speak with the voice of my agency. We're the same thing, basically. The, my dark ages were in 87 to 2002, where I was just really sinking into digital marketing, experimenting, getting good at the craft. And then I started a blog to start sharing best practices in 2003. And I was a horrible writer, but despite that, the passion and the, the, the kind of information I was sharing attracted a company called McKesson. You may not have heard of them, but they're a Fortune 5 company, and they're still our client, right? $195 billion company. Um, I started speaking a couple of years later. Horrible public speaker. Maybe you think the same till today. I don't know. But uh, the passion is what really wins people over. And I started speaking a little bit, and that led to me being more involved on the social web, attracting hundreds of thousands of followers and community across LinkedIn uh, and, and Twitter and Facebook and so forth. And I was offered to do a book by Wiley called Optimize, which you can easily find by searching Google for the word optimize, still uh, five years later. And uh, then I moved into being more of a collaborator. I was contributing to industry publications, writing a column for CMO.com, that sort of thing. And these last couple of years, I've been spending a lot more time uh, mentoring, helping other people become influential. And the amazing thing is, is that what I learned about that is that, and, and I'll talk about this more in a, in a second, but you, know, you may think by working with people that are influential, it'll help you become influential too. That's true. But what I've found is that when you then pass along that power, when you pass along that ability to shine a light to people on people that are coming up in the industry, that makes you even more influential and inspires an incredible amount of loyalty. And that is absolutely priceless in this age of information overload. So now, as a sort of being treated like an influencer by lots of different companies, I get engaged. Um, I, you know, I was invited to go to The Economist in New York and actually educate them on digital marketing topics. Same thing at Forbes headquarters. Uh, I get invited to conferences by IBM, by SAP, by Oracle, lots of other B2B technology companies as an influencer, and I get to make an incredible um, set of connections, and I learn a lot from those things. Now, this kind of exposure leads to free PR. We, I don't engage a PR firm, but I'm getting psyched. Every week, I'm doing two or three interviews, right? Um, and that inspires people to put me on lists. Like on the Forbes, on Forbes, they publish this list of people who influence CMOs, and that's part of the reason why I might have been invited to come here. Um, and that kind of exposure is amazing because it, it does create lots of opportunities. Over 200 speaking events in 17 different countries, which, now this is where the ROI is starting to come into play. This has given me access to an incredible mastermind network of marketers, literally all over the world. 
some of the smartest people I have ever met. We stay connected. We share ideas. And this is something everybody can do. And that credibility, that authority, that influence has allowed me to attract an amazing portfolio of clients and also a first-class team that work with me. We're just a small agency at 30-some people, but we're, and we're fighting way above our weight class in terms of the impact and the kinds of brands that we're working with. Again, why? Because people that are so talented, interested, they're, they're coming to us. We don't use rec- recruiters. Um, they're coming to us and wanting to work with our agency because they've heard about our reputation. I think these are lessons everyone here can take advantage of, whether you are the CEO of a large enterprise, you're a senior executive, you're, you're, you're a marketer at a mid-sized company, or you're a small business owner. Now, a couple of lessons I learned out of this personal journey are, one, I found it incredibly impactful, this idea of specificity, right? Stand for something, and stand for something specific, because that's what will help you rise to the top in a, in a sea of noise, right? And create signals of credibility for that specific thing in all the places where your customers may spend their time, right? Your unique selling proposition and that thing that you stand for need to align. This is an incredible way of achieving authority and credibility. Another lesson I learned in this in, uh, journey is that everyone is influential. Everyone in here that has talked to somebody, that has given a recommendation, and that person changed what they were going to do because of the recommendation. You just influenced them. You're doing this every single day. A holistic view of what and who is influential opened many, many, many doors to effectiveness instead of chasing the crack of the brand individual, the famous person with millions of followers and next to zero engagement. Another very, very important lesson that coincides with that is I realized that I've got to spend a lot less time thinking about the me, right? It's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's about the we. It's about the collective wisdom. It is about crowdsourcing. It is about democratizing the marketing function. Because when you can involve the very people that you're marketing to in the creation of your marketing content, that opens incredible doors or inspiration. That inspires them to help you make that marketing successful. And that blends into how well you're seen as an authority and credibility, uh, credible. So uh, we do a lot of work with industry influencers, mostly on the B2C, B2B side, not so much on the B2C. And one thing I've noticed is that when we're working with influencers, this drives value across the entire customer life cycle. If you're a marketing department and you're expected to do more and you don't have a lot more resources, developing a community of collaborators is an incredible way to scale quality content. You can attract people who have audiences that you're having a hard time reaching because you're at, because those audiences are using ad blocking. They don't trust ads, and yet people do trust peers, friends, and experts. You could engage people that have interesting or unique content creation skills that don't exist in your marketing department so you can create more engaging content. You can work with influencers who are trusted so you can increase, uh, increase your conversion rates. You can work with, uh, you can highlight your employees, right, to increase retention rates. You can highlight the most influential customers in your case studies and examples so you can inspire more advocacy. It works across the entire spectrum. So I'm going to share a couple of examples of companies. And again, most of my examples are B2B. Uh, and, and how they're taking these principles and putting them into action. So obviously, you've got to understand your customer. And not just who influences them, but what influences them. We were working with an IT service management company called Sherwell Software that wanted to pilot this idea of co-creation of content to increase their own credibility and marketing effectiveness. So we did. We did that exactly for th- uh, this particular customer segment, the CTO. And we used those insights about not only who influenced that customer, but what, what channels, what types of content, what types of media, what publications, and so forth, and created content experiences that were uh, engaging and relevant to that very specific customer segment. As a result, you know, yeah, it got a lot of shares and so forth, but the cool thing was that one pilot campaign drove 22% of all pipeline revenue for the entire year of 2017. With that pilot data, which is what we often do, 
we're now able to inform year-long campaigns going forward. Another example I'll share with you is SAP. SAP is launching a Leonardo uh, platform, and, you know, one of the triggers or key messages of this platform was the idea of digital transformation. And there were subtopics, everything from machine learning, artificial intelligence, blockchain, uh, web anal or analytics, and so forth. So what we did is, in order to create instant credibility for SAP around these topics, and granted, they're one of the largest companies in the world, they already have a lot of credibility, but not for this specific group, we invited industry influencers, people who are, had domain expertise specific to these subtopics, and we invited them to contribute uh, short-form tips, and, the, and we put this together as an interactive microsite. Now, uh, there's a 100% share and promotion rate by the influencers because it was a kind of a cool thing, not so common in B2B to have something interesting to be a part of. Uh, but it created over 21 million impressions with no ad spend. That solved the problem of creating affinity and exposure to SAP and Leonardo in a place where no one had heard of that uh, brand before. Another example I want to share with you um, is something we didn't work on, but I, I love this example. There's a company in the U.S., actually in Minneapolis, called Deluxe. And they are a 100-year-old check printing company. And I don't know if people still use checks here, you know, a little paper promise to pay, but, you know, world of e-commerce or digital commerce and credit cards and debit cards, it's kind of an antiquated way to do things. They decided they wanted to shift their business model and start uh, providing digital marketing services to small businesses. That's not check printing. So how do they create awareness and credibility and authority around that? They decided to create a movement and to create a contest. And they partnered with a, a, a celebrity, Robert Herjavec from Shark Tank, who was an advocate for them. And they were able to get some uh, earned media nationally because of that. But the coolest thing was they were able to create this contest that would award small towns with $500,000 of digital marketing services to the small businesses in those small towns and Deluxe sent camera crews to document the whole thing and they ended up creating a web TV series and they achieved a ridiculous amount of earned media coverage from the towns that were competing against each other and the social media uh, exposure from all the individuals who were incentivized to promote their favorite businesses. And here's a little Every bit about that program. You see a small business, someone made a courageous decision. People think the job creation engine for America is big business, but it's really not. Small business is the fiber of the United States. With the small business revolution, we really created a movement. And this year, we wanted to do something even bigger. We're taking the small business revolution to a community that really needs a Main Street revival. We all know of a great little town, frequent, or it just makes us smile and makes us happy. Deluxe and I are trying to help that community and make it even better. We're asking people to nominate their favorite small town, and then Deluxe is going to invest half a million dollars into the winning community, and Robert and Deluxe are going to be working directly with entrepreneurs within the town, helping them really get their business in great shape. So this is a program that has been running three years in a row, and the, let's see here, boom. Two billion earned media impressions, over a million video views, over a million visits to smallbusinessrevolution.org. Now it's known in the markets that they're trying to uh, uh, reach that Deluxe is a provider of small business digital marketing services. And it's, how, it, it's basically, I don't know if save their business is the right expression, but check printing and financial services... You know, creating a movement that people are inspired by and talking about and talking about, it's, it's had a huge impact for them. So the impact, of course, is, is manifest as, as something that's credibil uh, credible, credibility. I try to make up words sometimes. <laughs> so now about the secrets. Now, some secrets are hidden in plain sight. Some secrets are stuffed away in a corner, dark corner, never to be revealed. Um, I think these are things that a lot of people might know about intellectually, but they're not acting on them, and, and, and I hope to inspire you to do so. So the first secret is accelerate your internal and external credibility. So there's a couple of ways to do that. Internally, it makes sense not for you just as a marketer to, okay, let's execute the strategy and campaign that I got approved so I earn more budget next quarter and do that over and over and over again. Rather, or on top of that, 
find out what some of the key business problems that your senior executives are, are challenged to solve and see if there's any way that your marketing activities can help them solve those business problems. Trust me, if, if, if they have a, like product innovation or finding new channel partners or that sort of thing, uh, as a goal and you're able through marketing activities to help them solve those problems, all of a sudden now you're friends, right? And you're going to have some credibility within the organization. Also, um, as Margaret said, promote your wins, right? Connect with stakeholders internally and collaborate with them. And also make sure that you give them recognition for their part in collaborating with you. And externally, create the kind of content that makes your brand the best answer wherever customers are looking. And don't just think about informing them, but think about how you can create content experiences. It's not enough to inform people. Right? You've got to make them feel something. And that way, you'll get credibility with your customers. Double down on customer engagement. So this means, you know, a lot of people spend so much of their time engaging with prospective customers. As soon as they become a customer, it's only customer service that is the interaction touch point. And this is a huge lost opportunity, right? 78%, and this can manifest in a lot of different ways, uh, like online reviews. So 78% of people find online reviews useful. And, and, and it's even more than that, right? Because more and more people are going to online reviews and they're looking for firsthand experiences and evidence of credibility through things like reviews, whether it's B2B or B2C. So engage with your customers and implement programs that incentivize or encourage some sort of third party, or uh, encourages reviews. Um, and also, engaging with customers after the fact, not just waiting for them to have a problem to interact, will retain those customers. Just a 5% increase in retention can increase profitability by 25 to 95%, right? That shouldn't be a secret. Work with influencers to become influential. Now, again, this, this is an area where we spend a lot of time, and there's sort of a three-step dynamic uh, that makes this work. Uh, first step is to identify qualified influencers, right? Um, find influencers who not only have topical or domain expertise, but they have an active network that's paying attention to what they say. It's not enough that they're just experts. They need to have a network to distribute that content to. And find ways in which you can share values and share goals and make something together. Make something together for the greater good, Make something for the benefit of your customers. And then you've got to qualify those influencers. And you've got to qualify their audience. We're in the world of fake influencers, purchased influencers, bots, and all that sort of stuff. Unilever just made a very big announcement. They're, 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 uh, they're dropping all influencers who have any evidence of having purchased uh, audience or people in their network. And this is important. Um, so... You've got to validate not just when you find the right influencer and you encourage them to be part of a program. You've got to do this on a periodic basis. I recommend at least once a quarter because they may decide all of a sudden where previously they didn't want to buy followers. Now they want to make a lot more money. So all of a sudden now they're part of your program. They want to start buying a lot more followers. You've got to account for that. And then engage. Employ always on social listening and engagement initiatives. You can use software to do this, but you've got to keep the love alive, right? And if you're working with influencers organically, meaning that's most of what we do, we, don't, we only pay influencers maybe 10 or 15% of the time. We find things they care about. We find things the brand cares about that intersect, and we work together and everybody wins. But the only thing that keeps those influencers from leaving is the relationship. So it's important especially when you're working with organic influencers, to, to uh, maintain a connection and to engage with them. A fourth secret um, is to create content collaboration ecosystem. There's only so much you can do. There's only so much your marketing department can do or your company can do. But imagine if you're able to create a VIP community of collaborators, influencers, who could be employees, they could be customers, they could be industry experts. They could be prospective customers. That's my favorite, right? Making content with the very people you're trying to market to. 
If you create an ecosystem of people with domain expertise and with channels of distribution, now all of a sudden you can create scale, content at scale, and the kind of content, again, that contributes to objectives we have across the entire customer journey. And the fifth secret I'll share with you is about optimization on, on measurement, right? And we use, I like to use, to keep content and marketing accountable, we like to use an attract, engage, convert model. So the specific metrics depend on how you're approaching this, but you've got to answer these questions and identify the metrics that align whether you're successful or not in each of these areas. So is your marketing reaching the right audience um, and in the channels that they're influenced by, right? Are you engaging with customers with content and media? Are you creating great experiences? Are you creating raving fans or not? And is your content marketing or is your marketing inspiring them to make decisions to move them through that journey, right? Are you inspiring them to take action or not? And ultimately, does that marketing activity, whether it's branding or whether it's uh, end of funnel uh, targeting, does it actually contribute to revenue or not? So I'm not talking about, I'm talking about content, I'm talking about influence, but I'm talking or hopefully, hopefully inspiring you to sort of adopt this idea of creating a community of participation, right? Democratized marketing. Again, if you want to be credible, if you want to have authority, invite people to collaborate, invite influencers to collaborate, invite people who have a stake in the success of what you're working on together to collaborate, to create content that is more meaningful, that is more valuable than the stuff that you could make all by yourself. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of uh, sort of takeaways, things that are, represent some of the DNA of success uh, for the many brands that we work with on these content marketing programs where they do realize the benefits of increased credibility, authority, and influence. Uh, the first, and I think this is something that you probably heard a lot about lately, is purpose, right? Um, I think it's Simon Sinek that said, it's not, people don't buy from you because of what you do. They, they buy from you because of why you do it. And if the world was different as a result of your company being in it, what is that difference? What is your purpose, right? How are you changing the world? Define that and start to include that in your messaging. I recently did a, uh, a presentation with uh, one of our clients, LinkedIn, and the, the, the gal I was presenting with uh, is sort of a millennial marketing expert. She tapped LinkedIn's research and data to, do some, uh, to find some insights around how millennials perceive content. And one of the interesting findings was is when a millennial aged buyer, especially in B2B, goes to a company website, the very first thing they look for is the corporate social responsibility or cause type initiatives that brand is involved with. You know, I thought about that. It's like, you know how many B2B brands, B2B brands that are out there that are basically hiding that stuff under PR, news about us somewhere? And, and so it's a real opportunity. Purpose. Define it, use it, communicate it, and, and, and make it a part of your brand. Relevance. Now, this me-centric, egocentric view a lot of brands take in deciding, okay, we've got to boost sales, so we're going to push this information about these products and services so we can make our quarter goals. And, you know, obviously that conflicts with sometimes the relevance of the information. Like, how do you know customers actually care about what it is that you're promoting? So use data to understand what your customers truly care about and to create compelling content experiences in context, uh, in, in, in the context of what will be relevant to them to create value for them. Reach, again, the best answer, be the best answer, right? That singular expression represents an entire strategy that we implement when it comes to content for companies that we do business with. Being the best answer is about that topic specificity. It is about how you create more value and with more depth than any other resource out there. And this is recognized not only by humans, but by so people on social networks and the social networks themselves in terms of ranking of content. It's recognized by Google and any other search engine that's going to rank and position content. And resonance. Again, truly understand what it is that your customers care about so that when 
they do interact with your content, that you create a moment of clarity, a moment of truth, if you will, where they're triggered to take that next step and they are inspired to take the action that you want them to take. These can sound very obvious, unfortunately, um, or, or, or I guess uh, they sound like common sense, but unfortunately, a lot of companies simply don't have them baked in to the strategy and processes, and especially when you're uh, focusing on short-term revenue goals as opposed to growing market share. So with that, we have a, a few minutes for some questions. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you just need to lift your hand up and you can ask Lee your questions. My lovely hostess, who's walking the ramp backstage. Uh, uh, in your early days, uh, what I understand is uh, you used uh, more of uh, uh, organic uh, uh, search, uh, organic content, etc. And when right now you are engaged with brands, and but at the same moment, like you're using paid media as well as organic media. So any uh, like ratio or how much you spent on uh, organ? I mean on paid media. How for much brands basically? Sure. So how much? I, I mean uh, I mean percentage. <laughs> percentage. <laughs> any information about the split between organic media and paid media? Um, in our case, it's probably sixty percent, seventy percent organic, and. We use organic in a lot of pilots. I mean, actually, we use paid and organic sim uh, similarly. When we have a situation where a client has a substantial publishing uh, entity and they have a substantial amount of traffic, we'll do an organic pilot to inform uh, paid media spend. When they do not, we'll do uh, paid pilots to inform a longer-term or, uh, organic effort. So really, it, it really depends on what we have to work with what the split is between organic and paid, but overall, it's 60, 70 percent organic for us, and uh, with the 30, 40 percent being paid. Cool. All right, one, now we've got time for one more question. Anybody else? You don't need to feel shy, or there you go. I know. Here's a question. How did I lose, what is it, uh, 60 pounds? What is that? I don't know how many kilos that is, but, no, sorry. Uh, hello, Mr. Auden. Welcome to By India. By growing a beard. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, you had some really good insights about uh, consumer trust shifting. Uh, I, I was wondering if we could see those two slides again about uh, the consumer trust shifting. That was really insightful. I don't think I have control. I can make that sound. Okay. Okay. Can't... And so, so when you are when you are uh, filtering the influencers. So what advice do you have for somebody who is uh, trying to create influence on digital platforms uh, regarding this uh, organic and uh, bot uh, sure. following and stuff? What are the advices you have? Absolutely. So one of the best tips I can give you around growing a, an influencer program and deciding what the mix of paid and organic, so you're able to find influencers who are actively representing themselves and their interests out of the marketplace. They are publishing content, they're speaking in events, they're publishing books, clearly they're playing the game. So they have a vested interest in getting more exposure. If you can come to them and give them something that they're not getting, uh, like exposure in a very specific way or on topics that they really care about, that way you can invite them organically, i.e. for free, to um, participate in your program because they're getting something out of it. So a lot of uh, organic programs that we implement, um, the influencers come back to us and they say, not only do they have a great experience, but they're getting uh, offers of paid speaking gigs, they're getting consulting gigs, they're getting book deals and so on and so forth as a result of their exposure from the program we invited them to be a part of. There are certain roles, there are certain um, uh, uh, responsibilities that deserve to be paid for. So, for example, emceeing an event. Uh, that's certainly worth being paid for. Um, if I'm not getting paid much, though. <laughs> you need a raise. <laughs> With a voice like that, you need a raise. When, if, if it's a long-form content, or if it's something that's substantial, when it, uh, the craft of creation is involved, usually there's uh, uh, compensation involved with a thing like that. Um, and so it really depends on what your needs are. When identifying 
influencers, you'll be able to surface those opportunities, organic or paid, according to what you find. In many cases, this starts with a specific topic that you want to be influential about. And you can go to an influencer discovery engine like Tracker or on Analytica or on the low end BuzzSumo, which focuses mostly on blogs and Twitter, and you can pop in keywords. It'll spit back in search results a list of people, and then you can start to look at what it is that they're doing. How are they behaving? And you can scope with, with experience in the, in the field. You can scope who will work purely for exposure, who you're going to have to hire. So Gary Vaynerchuk, I'm going to have to pay him. But Michael Brenner, I, because I've got a seven-year relationship with him and got, he's benefited substantially from things in the marketing world, I, I'm, I may, I'm probably not going to have to pay him. But I have paid Michael for very specific things. That's a really long answer, wasn't it? Okay, last question. Here you go. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, considering um, the whole session here was about how to be a influencer. I mean, uh, in life, when you start off to be an influencer, it's not always very hunky-dory. You start off at a very strong point, and then the people around you probably can't see you proceed, and then the spare, uh, you know, the crab mentality comes in, and then you pull down. So how do you resurrect yourself from a place of being at the rock bottom? Because that's when you need to bounce up. Sure. So, so as far as becoming an influencer yourself as an individual, you know, it's got to be aligned with interests that you've already demonstrated. Uh, I do see people, I mean, uh, they tend to be a lot younger than me, that uh, go on the web and they see these famous people and they decide, I can act like that. If I act like that, I'm going to get all kinds of sponsorship money from major brands. No, no. Uh, so you don't automatically become an influencer so when someone does abruptly change their behaviors and start behaving in that way, they're going to get some negative feedback probably from the people that are closest to them. If they're not genuine or authentic in the kinds of information they're publishing or promoting, they're probably going to get some negative feedback. So the thing you have to find is your own personal purpose. What is it that you truly care about? How are you trying to change the world? How are you trying to change your own world and the people around you in a positive way? If you can really define what that is and how you can advance the good news about the things you care about, about products, about services, whatever it is that you're interested in, if you can do that with, by being genuine, that's something that you'll find will lift you up. It's something that will make you more accepted uh, by the people who actually give you influence. I can't hear you. All right, we've got the bell also ringing right now. So, all right, thanks so much, Lee. I'm going to be very genuine and say I really love what you spoke on stage. All right, <laughs> and you can probably kick me out of the MCing business because you're such a good orator. So there you go. But you know what? I've got something to say. Thank you too, uh, Sindhu Pillai, Senior Manager, Media Solutions, Matrabumi.com. Can you come and give uh, a lovely token of appreciation? And we had Gadri giving you a thumbs up as well. She liked you. You approve? <laughs> you give a thumbs up? All right, there you go. Thank you very much. You know, he deserves at least three of those gifts here. Yeah? Don't be so stingy, man. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, All right, thank Well you. done. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Pleasure.